Hello, everyone, and welcome to our sixth episode of Essence of Wonder. We appreciate you being here and coming back every week. Today, we're going to talk about countering fake news. Our first panel is going to be about society and policy, led by Malka Older. Then we're going to meet Michael Morgenstern, who is working on a movie on the topic, and that will be pretty awesome. Moving from that, we'll also have a panel around operations. How do we actually counter fake news and what that means? Because fake news will be covered um, as a general topic as opposed to anything political, which we will get into. And with that, I would like to invite Karen Castelletti, my co-host, to talk to me. Hello, Karen. Hi, Gadi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm excited to talk about the idea of fake news and disinformation with all of you um, and with our many amazing panelists and guests today. Um, the, the idea of you know, any of these ideas, fake news, disinformation, they're not new. The, the idea of using information for strategic influence is about as new as Sun Tzu. Um, and is, you know, it's perhaps it's intrinsically human to, to tell stories, to change stories, to, to create different uh, beliefs in people with how you tell those stories and how they get echoed. And so one thing I want to, you know, I find interesting is why is this such a topic now? What is, what is going on now in our world? And I think what's really new and different and interesting and why we wanted to put this together is that the scale and the scope of the problem has really changed with technology. You didn't used to have individuals able to reach a third of humanity overnight. And it's, you know, inherently very new. Mm. Well, I can tell you that this is not only about politics as we'll discuss and try to avoid, but as a foreigner, you know, the, the one thing I found interesting is that two sides, the two sides of the U.S. argument, the two main sides of the U.S. argument on various topics actually agree on one thing, and that is that the other side is using fake news and not <laughs> always are even aware that is actually the case with our side. So bottom line, it's a loaded subject. It's a loaded term. What does it even mean? When I say fake news, people often just immediately jump at a specific president, a news channel, a specific country, a social network, and the discussion ends there. As I recently uh, heard from uh, SJ, who will be on the second panel and can tell us who that was, a friend of her recently called the most or many of the discussions on the topic admiring the problem. And I really hope that in today's uh, sessions we can go deeper than that because I feel that's kind of, of a totem-like response. You know, it's, it's almost an emblem, like we worship at these words and I want to get kind of more than that. Does that make sense? It does. And, and to frame it as a problem, you know, what the problem is, I think, is questionable. Um, you know, if the problem is that humans communicate and are effective at it, you know, I'm not clear that it should just be suppressed. Um, I, I think of art a lot, which has this you know, tremendous power to influence the world and other people's opinions. And I've um, been thinking lately about what live art is really prevalent in humanity. And I, I've been chewing on the idea that the most successful and widespread forms of live art in the world are actually religious ceremonies and, you know, churches and, and these gatherings. Oh, kind of like, uh, like hymns, the story about hymns. Oh, yeah. So the, um, the churches of Europe, um, yeah, this, this is from a, like a documentary I saw like 20 years ago, but um, they weren't centralized. And one approach that the, you know, as I recall, one of the things the Vatican did to try to assert control and, and normalize the ideas was to distribute hymn books. So, you know, they were using these pieces of art and, you know, songs, music to, you know, really be a, an early version of mass communication. Mm. Uh, you know, mass communication is, you'll appreciate this, mass communication is actually, I, I came to appreciate art. I was this STEM-based kid. What's our emotions? What is all this stuff about stuff, essentially? It's, it doesn't have numbers in it. And I watched this documentary, speaking of documentary, about mass communication, and they showed a coin with the likeness of Xerxes from Persia on it. And they said this was the first time in history where art was used for mass communication to help control the empire. And that was kind of interesting. And on what you mentioned, the problem isn't you. You would, okay? you would never have seen Xerxes except for every time you touch money. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I suppose that is true. Um, that made me appreciate art, though. So the problem isn't you. And one example I like, if we leave Sun Tzu aside for a second, is Catherine the Great. She had this internal to Russia, not an expert historian here, um, view and how people saw her. And then when she communicated with the West, it was a completely different thing. It was a Renaissance, New Age, whatever you would like to call it thing, uh, 
Voltaire appreciated her a lot. And I think what's shifted, if we were to bring this in, is the ability for any organization or even an individual to weaponize speech, making it an asymmetrical challenge. And this used to be limited in, uh, to a capability of nation states, powers, or organizations of similar levels of powers. And the, on the, and the same thing from the other side, this can now be used not just against nations, but against organizations and individuals specifically. Yeah, it's interesting. All the examples that we've been talking about are rulers of nation states or, or you know, worldwide organizations. And yeah, we, we see it you know, very differently now. Um, though, Gadi, like you say, you, you take a stance on this that I'm not sure anyone else that we have here today agrees with and nor, oh, no, nor do no. I that we everything, really all of this is entertainment. We should, we should just take nearly everything as entertainment. So well, you know, what's, uh, and I, I, before even letting you, you know, go further into that, you know, I, I kind of want to speak to like, why is that bad? Um, and, you know, there, we see a lot of material that, you know, is a very questionable basis. You were not all going to become experts in everything, but, you know, what, what's being undermined here is really the, the fact itself, you know, facts matter. I, I think it is, if we, if we have to have the argument as, as low down as our, do facts exist and do they help you prepare better um, to, to be fit to your environment, to face the world, um, I think we'd have a, a very difficult time arguing up from that point. And that is a lot of what we're seeing in the world. Like I am sort of of two tribes. If you will, if you will talk of, you know, the U.S. View, political viewpoints, you know, there are different tribes. Um, I, the, the one that I grew up in is not really the one that I've chosen and am surrounded by more today, but I'm still in both social bubbles. And I get to see how, it's a unique perspective to see how both sides are very internally consistent and reasonable, but it's the facts, not, not so much the values, but the actual facts that they're basing things on that have really wandered uh, from one another over the years to, to the point where if I accepted one set of facts or the other, I would have one of two completely different viewpoints. And it's, you know, it's, this is new and, and alarming. It's almost a large step back for society. I, I can see that. Um, on entertainment, I'll say it's just that I appreciate fake news or whatever you want to call it, disinformation, misinformation. Our lovely uh, Professor Brad Allenby will talk about uh, weaponized narrative, which I love and you love. But essentially, when I do things every day, I can't stop to think so much. I can't have make so many decisions every day. So for me, everything is entertainment. Everything is positive. Everything is fine. If I actually need to go and do something, I'll research it. I think it's unreasonable to ask people to do that for everything. But I do agree facts matter. I will say, not being an expert on humanity as a whole, I don't want to make these decisions every day. So I believe we need to stick with it. I, need, we, I don't think anybody would agree with me, but we need to kind of, to a degree, without giving up on fighting it, see everything as entertainment and not try to force people to go against their nature. I mean, I, this, is, this is where like scale and scope creep back into the conversation. In a, in a very real sense, we never used to have to have or have the opportunity to have opinions on everything. The information wasn't available to us and you know, we almost, there was no opportunity to, to convince ourselves that we could be experts on everything. I don't know anything about farming, but I, I now uh, feel that I could go, go learn it if I Googled the right thing. Well, uh, you know, people say the edge of the internet, the age of information, it's also the age of discourse. You know, we are all affected, we're all influenced. The reason we're talking about fake news, it can be weaponized and is used against us daily. And I even would often feel that we're taking extreme positions more and more, or even as a performative stance, not necessarily our opinions to discourse. And we kind of have to, if you look back and forgive me, my American history is off. It wasn't him, I think. But the message in the, the Revolutionary War, when Paul Revere went out there, if it would have been, you know, the Brits are kind of okay. They took care of us during famine and they take care of us with, uh, when we're ill, but the taxing of tea, man, that wouldn't have worked. You have to take a strong stance. And, you know, um, I think you kind of uh, had some points on that, but Bottom line is the inherent challenge in countering all of this. How do we avoid infringing our free speech? Do we delete an influencer's post if it's fake news? How do we, um, even if we try to do something to counter it all, it ends up being going to a different audience. For example, a hot button issue somebody is against, do we do a four? Doesn't even change the entire operational aspect of this. And people usually say, 
when I ask them about countering fake news, going technical, whitelist or blacklist it, give me a choice, some sort of reputation system in my browser, on Facebook, whatever it is. Um, let's fight bots, let's, let's take down fake profiles or education is the solution for all. And of course it's part of the solution, but I would like to go beyond that. I would like to be more specific. So our expectations in a way is for us people in, to in tech, who are dealing with the adversarial nature of things, being asked to deal with this phenomenon and more and more, and that is not necessarily right for us. So my expectation from the second panel is to go into detail on how this can be done. This is also a good moment to make a quick point about how we want to run the panels and the conversations today, which is that where possible, we would like to keep this conversation, which we know can be really controversial, um, constructive by avoiding some of these, these totem entities um, where possible. Um, obviously, there's going, there will be specific points that, that folks want to make, but um, you know, by, by trying to lean out of rather than into the problem and bring as many folks to the table as we can, um, that's something that Gadi and I are hoping to, to instill in this conversation today. Um, this is also a good opportunity to uh, turn it over to some of our guests. Gadi? Absolutely. So we're going to bring in our special guest today, David Weber, who is an amazing science fiction writer, our a friend of the show, um, been here a lot. The Honor Huntington University is something he created. We appreciate him a lot. Hi, David. Malka Hi. Older. Hey, Malka Older, who is just so competent and is alma mater in every university she ever attended, which is a huge name and is successful and wrote Informocracy and changed the language around how we speak. And she's also joining us as the, as the moderator for the first panel. And Sunil Yu who is one of my favorite people, is joined me on many different uh, projects before. He's currently CISO in residence at Wild Ventures. He was chief scientist at Bank of America, done a lot of really cool things. Hi, Sunil. Hi, Malta. Hey, folks. So we would like to just turn it over to you. We had a challenge defining what politics is. How do we stay away from it in this discussion? How is that even possible with the discussion on so-called fake news? And this is a great way for you to just take it away. So let's start with David, go to Malka, and then Sunil. Oh, start with me. Oh, um, I think that uh, a lot of what Gotti and Karen were, were talking about, about how long uh, the use of fake news has been a part of the human condition, really needs to be fundamental to any discussion going forward. Ebooks, for example, have done for, for book sales what Gutenberg did on steroids. And that's precisely what we're looking at here in terms of the, the amount, the degree of information that is now available to us. We've reached a point where we have so much information that we have less information because we simply can't process it all. Um, and I think that's one reason why in some cases we are more prone to seek out our bubbles, those tribal elements that you were talking about, Karen, because it's pre-filtered for us. In, in that group. And we only have so much time, so much capacity to devote to it. In that respect, I really don't think it's a solvable problem. Uh, I think that it is uh, an issue of learning to live with it and deal with it, hopefully, as a society. And that, I think, requires less that we, we are able to eliminate fake news than we are to acknowledge the existence of fake news on both sides of any question, any equation. That we have to understand that our tribe is producing fake news shaped narrative, whatever you want to call it, just as much as the other side is, and be kind of uh, uh, evaluative uh, on that basis. And so that's where I'm coming from on this. And that's, what can I say? Sure enough, appreciate it. Malka. Yeah, I, um, I tend to be pretty leery of ideas about not discussing politics in any of these things, um, partly because I think it's impossible not to discuss politics when you're talking about this or really anything. Um, that's my sociologist socially constructed background. Um, also because I think it has a tendency to push people towards a kind of both sidism that isn't always very useful. That said, um, I do see the point of trying to avoid, particularly in a discussion like this, rehashing the he said, he said, or this side is right, this side is wrong. It's just not particularly useful either in terms of convincing people or in terms of getting out something new, which I think is what we're trying to do here and really analyze the problem and think about what some potential responses are. 
I also, you know, I agree with the, the discussion that has gone on so far about how this is a problem that is not new. It has been around for a long, long time. Um, and certainly the technology has affected it, both the way it happens and the scale on which it happens. But I would argue that one of the really important distinctions about this moment is that we are in a time where we at least claim to live in and believe in democracy. And so we're in a time where people are actually expected to make decisions about the way that they are governed. And to do that, you need to have good information. You need to have access to information. And so that's the point, I think, where this is getting more and more important. And as, as far as, uh, so first of all, um, I wanna be able to clarify one bit of fake news. So I am not a fake news expert. Um, I am a technology expert and, uh, or at least I think I can um, hold my own in that space. So I, I'm thrilled to actually be amidst a whole bunch of people who actually do consider them consider themselves to be experts in this space. Um, I, what I would love to be able to get out of it, I mean, for, first of all, so I live in Washington, D.C., so I, I can't escape politics being where I am. Um, so if we can have a respite for the next two hours talking about politics, that'd be great. Uh, but that's it. I mean, it's going to be hard to avoid politics. Um, and so hopefully we'll navigate away from that as, as much as we can throughout this discussion. Um, what I would love to be able to dive into is going to be, uh, I, I would love to learn out of this whole conversation, even just understanding not just the fake part of it, but what is truth? Uh, what is truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? And how do we actually discern that? How do we uh, have foundations for that? And in this po postmodernistic world, can you even determine what fake news is if there's no definition of what's truth, right? And so uh, being able to explore some of the philosophical aspects of that would be also very interesting. And uh, we have a great set of guests who, again, who really um, have uh, bona fides in the, in the fake news space that uh, I, would I think we're gonna have a great discussion and great dialogue to uh, dive into that deeper. So back over to you, Gadi. Thank you, Sunil, I appreciate it. And with that, we'll call our panelists which we again appreciate are here. They've all taken out of their time on the weekend. John Rendon. Then we're gonna also ask Brent, Professor Braden Allenby. Richard Marshall. And essentially we just like to, I would just like to say I appreciate Malka agreeing to also do this and call her in to just take it away. Thank you, Gadi. So, I'm very excited to have this conversation with our esteemed panelists and talk a little bit about the policy and society angles on this problem. Um, so first I'd like to ask all of you to introduce yourselves briefly and we'll go from there. We can start with, well, David, you've already talked, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I am an old guy, I'm 67, um, and uh, I have been uh, publishing science fiction for about 30 years now. So I have been shaping entire fictitious worlds for that amount of time. Thanks, and John? Uh, so good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever anybody is currently located uh, under house arrest. Uh, a thousand years ago, when I was young, I served as executive director and political director of the Democratic Party. So good luck not getting into politics. Um, I, I also served as director of scheduling in advance for President Carter, 20-something uh, uh, in and around the White House. Uh, and then an on-camera and an off-camera analyst for BBC, a small daily global audience of 365 million people. Uh, but probably most significantly for the last 35 years and change, anytime there has been a deployment of U.S. forces or a major national security issue, we get in, brought in to provide support uh, in the information environment. So um, until eight weeks ago, I would tell you that I spend most of my time living in overhead luggage compartments, going to places where duck is a verb as well as a noun. Uh, but now I get up in the morning, look in the mirror, hope to see Luke, and I know that Obi-Wan is staring back at me. So thank you again, and over to you. <laughs> thank you, um, and I hope it's a little bit restful as well. Um, and Brad, please. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Brad Allenby. Uh, I was a corporate lawyer and then an executive at AT&T. Uh, I'm now an engineering professor at Arizona State University with a focus on 
emerging technologies and particularly working on the theory of weaponized narrative uh, as opposed to the, to the details. So the philosophy part appeals to me. Um, and trying to address broader questions also, like whether technology uh, and the information structure we have today are undermining pluralism and uh, shifting advantage, uh, which has been with pluralism for 200 years, over to soft authoritarianism. Thanks, very uh, important, useful work. And Richard, could you introduce yourself, please? And you need to unmute. Okay, I'm not a gray beard, I'm a white beard. I've been around for a while. My major claim to fame is eligible receiver 97. I was the legal and political architecture for that, which was the world's first uh, organized cyber attack by the white hats. Uh, against a U.S. major cyber command. And uh, that led to the United States finally recognizing that the cyber threat was real. Uh, that was in my position as uh, an associate uh, general counsel at the National Security Agency. Later did a lot of uh, cybersecurity work with the Department of Homeland Security. I've stayed active in that field as a lawyer and as a reformed hacker now that the statute of limitations is run. And I'm currently the chairman of the board of a major project in the Middle East where we're putting in a new fiber optic cable system from France and Italy under the Med, across Israel, across Jordan, over, around, and through Saudi Arabia to India and Singapore. Great. Thank you all. It's great to have you all here. And this is a really interesting range of expertise that we've got to turn to this problem. Although I'm also quite happy that I'm here to keep it from being a totally all male panel. Um, so let's get started then. We've heard a little bit of discussion already about um, the fact that this is a problem that's gone on for a long time, but that there's some different dimensions to it now. So I'd like to hear from um, whoever would like to add to what was already stated, why they think this is a, a critical issue now particularly. What makes this moment of disinformation different? Well, I'll, I'll start out just to stir the pot. I think it's because of, it's exacerbated because of the partisan divide, particularly here in the United States. And I'm being very careful to avoid politics. But I grew up at a time where the mainstream media appeared to be, or at least from my perspective at that time, uh, to be balanced. But nowadays, you don't my perception is you don't get news, you get op-eds presented as news. And but depending on the TV station, uh, you get what they call a narrative, which is actually a bias in my mind, on what they're trying to convince you to believe. And I find that very frustrating. Uh, those there are a number of people who are smart enough to realize the problem and can handle it. But unfortunately, my personal opinion, the large number of voters uh, get caught up in this bias train and don't know how to get off. And Thank it's you. further exacerbated by uh, Google, for example. Uh, and the other specters that they talk about. And I'm being very careful not to get too political here. I don't mind, but uh, I think Brad wanted to follow up on this. Okay. So I think uh, one of the things that's important in looking at this, and that's actually caused a lot of trouble in the implementation side, is trying to understand what is uh, what we can draw from history and what is different. Um, and I think we've done a very bad job of that because I think fundamentally a couple of things have shifted which uh, dramatically changed the impact of disinformation. I mean, we're all familiar with reflexive control and the ideas that the Soviets had that they were going to get us all to behave in certain ways. That was always a pipe dream in the Cold War. We didn't have the technology, we didn't know about humans. But now with behavioral economics, uh, uh, combined with advances in neuroscience, combined with a fundamental change in information, volume, velocity, and variety. Uh, 
Uh, I think what we've got is a situation where what we used to think could understand and manage information flows has failed. Uh, the talk about disinformation is important for the immune system to react to the immediate challenges, say interference in the 2020 election. But what it overlooks is the fact that if human beings and their institutions are becoming increasingly unable to manage the flow of information that they're subjected to, then what we have is a failure of the fundamental premise of democracy, which is that you do have an informed citizen. If, if we are effective enough in managing citizens of other countries through disinformation, through targeted attacks, Cambridge Analytica done right, um, then the very premise of democracy fails. And I think that, that not that we shouldn't be doing the immune system, which we should, obviously, but also we need to in parallel be trying to understand the more fundamental changes this implies and that we are not doing. Okay, and John? Yeah, just a thought. I mean, uh, this has been going on for a long time. I mean, the reference earlier to Sun Tzu is very valid. But part of the challenge we have now, and, and uh, I, I think Google was, was just mentioned, but the notion that people are searching only to prove pre-existing belief sets and not searching to prove themselves wrong has helped further isolate people. And we probably shift from one universe we recognize to a collection of, of multiverses. Uh, where we only allow people in that we agree with. But the real change that, that we've noticed, particularly over the last 10 years, and it changes, is that everybody lives in a time deficit environment. Nobody has enough time to deal with everything that's on their plate. And they try to harvest information as quickly as possible. And so information enters the environment um, with an acceleration and a velocity we've never comprehended. And the ability to identify tag, track, and then engage information is something that a number of people have thought about, but nobody's been able to do. And, and this challenge between disinformation and misinformation, if I might. So uh, I've got a, my own point of view about facts. They have only one of two characteristics. You either have a true fact or a false fact. There is no such thing as an alternative fact. And the art form that has evolved over time, and it is an art form, I should point out, is um, when disinformation goes into play, it is built on a foundation of pieces of facts. And let's just say, hypothetically, there are 10 facts, three of which are false and seven of which are true. And it is virtually impossible to destroy that piece of information as it moves into the information environment is absorbed by carbon life forms and is acted upon the judgments those carbon life forms make. And therein lies the dynamics with which we're confronted. Over. I think, I think that, um, Rick, to Richard's original point. Uh, Dave, uh, can you give me a second? Um, Brad yes. had a follow up and then, and then we'll go to you. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to I was just going to point out that uh, I think that people being more susceptible to disinformation today is not a um, uh, is not a deliberate choice. It is a retreat from too much information across all available channels. And what you have, particularly if you don't have, say, the technical education of the people that are, that are on this, this webinar, what you have is people who are suddenly thrust into a world of magic where technology is changing across the entire frontier. They don't understand it. They can't understand it. Um, those of us who have more information and education can't understand it. And so what they do is they retreat into their fundamental narratives because it's a form of protection. It's how they're protecting themselves psychologically. And that means that combined with things like confirmation bias means that anything that says, well, we're just going to educate the American people and make them better citizens. That's not going to happen. That train is left. Okay, David, please go ahead. 
I was I was just going to say that to Richard's original point, I remember when uh, John Chancellor began giving commentary on the news and he would appear under a little lit sign that said commentary. That was the firewall that was expected to exist between John's true facts and, and false facts. Um, and it came out of a mindset that there was a binary true untrue rather than a, well, you know, what's true for you may not be true for me kind of, kind of mindset to it. Um, what I can't quite make my mind up about, and this is to the point that Brad was raising, is the extent to which what's true for you isn't true for me is a purely defensive mechanism in the face of so much information. Uh, tribalism, yes, we are, we're all guilty of it. But I think that the, the, the primary problem that we are looking at is that, as has already been said, we can only uh, process so much information and we're given far more of it than we can. Um, it's, when you, when you start, I just read an article in the Wall Street uh, Journal about Google, uh, uh, erasing links over false claims of copyright infringement or whatever. When we're talking about weaponizing information flow, I think we not only need to talk about the introduction of false narratives, we need to talk about the elimination of accurate narratives as part of the weaponization process. Okay, this is painting a pretty grim picture. I, I do want to problematize it for just a moment here before we go into some of the, I don't know if we're going to talk about solutions, but some of the, the, the possibilities for countering. But while we're talking about this, this new landscape, I mean, if we look at this, this past where there was fact and, and non-fact and there was news and there was opinion, but there were still different um, tribes of information, if you want to call it back then. We, you know, a city would have at least two newspapers and what newspaper your household subscribed to would tell you a lot about the politics of that household. That was the proto cable news channel bubble. But now we have a lot more than two, right? Even if you're stuck on cable news, at least we have a couple. If you're into the internet, we have lots and lots of voices available. There's, a, and I think there's something to be said for the diversity of opinions that are coming out. Can we democratize information without democratizing facts? I, I think the answer is yes. And I'm saying that not just because I'm optimistic. Let's look at history professors. Um, you know, history, the rubric is history is written by the victor. They have a group of facts and then they analyze those groups of facts to fit their supposed narrative, although they give you the impression that they are learning as they go through and analyze the facts and then come up with the opinion, as opposed to having an opinion they want to bolster by the collecting of facts. Uh, more and more, when you look at historians, uh, particularly the revisionist historians, they tell you up front what their bias is. Now, I think we can learn from that example. Our information leaders, whomever they might be, uh, need to be very careful of their inherent bias and try to be very honest and balanced in making their presentation and letting the receptor decide whether or not it's a valid analysis. Now, I know that's a difficult challenge for, for some perhaps, but when we're talking about an objective, I think that's the objective we should be looking for. Okay, thank you. Other perspectives on this? Okay, moving on then. And we'll go on to the next question, which I do wanna start into the, the larger question for this show, which is not just about disinformation, but about countering disinformation. What can we be doing in the face of this pretty bleak information landscape. Well, one thing that would have helped would be for all of these medical experts that were talking about the virus, if they could get their act together. I mean, they always talk about the scientific approach and how fundamentally correct it is. 
but yet all of these supposed sciences, scientists with degrees, with proper education, can't agree on what's going on. And that undermines the confidence of the public in experts. It undermines the confidence of the public, but I think that it is inevitable in some respects because we have so many people over such a broad area who are being forced to react in real time. They, they don't have the time to build the scientific modeling that they would like to. They have, they have to shoot from the hip. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing here in the information flow age is that playing out on a world level where everyone is being exposed to it, not just the policymakers who are getting the advice from these people. Yeah. Valid point, and I would agree. But I would also offer the example of the British scientist who, who projected how everything was going to play out. And it would have, it, when I read his report, I said, okay, this is just his opinion. But everybody, that I talked to took it at face value. Here's an expert, he's right. And now it's turned out he's grossly wrong. He's totally embarrassed. He's out of a job. And there's a loss of confidence in the scientific community, unfortunately. So we have, which means we have a, a problem here is that we're not only talking about facts and lies. We're also talking about something that I think in this world we're pretty uncomfortable with, which is stuff we don't know stuff we are still figuring out. Um, Brad, you wanted to weigh in on this too. Yeah, I think that, that first you have a problem when you're a scientist or an engineer in a rapidly developing area. Because if you're honest, you always put in the uncertainties. And if, even if you put in the uncertainties, when it hits the public dialogue, when the public dialogue is so polarized, it becomes reified. So. Uh, the best example I can think of is the two degree rise in temperature, which everybody on the policy side talks about and takes as an article of faith. That is an arbitrary artifact of a model which may or may not be valid about climate change. It's, a, it's been reified because people have all of these other objectives, the context that they're trying to bring into it. And I think the idea that, that, that we as enlightenment thinkers have that there is such a thing as facts outside of context is a very dangerous one. I mean, uh, the best example is, I'm sure you all remember, at least those of you that are my age, remember the picture of the uh, North, uh, South Vietnamese general executing uh, a VC operative in the street, ran in the Washington Post. It was absolutely factual. And yet that single photograph probably did more than anything to turn American opinion against the Vietnam War. So what you have, I think, when you talk about facts is you have an inherent bias towards our tribal perspective. And I think it's important to realize that the purpose of a narrative is, is to allow you to filter out the facts you don't agree with. And as long as it doesn't disagree with something fundamental like gravity, it works. That's how you develop your community. That's your identity. So I think that the, the focus on facts begins to run a little light when it runs into the complexity of human culture and human identity. Identity is the new battle space. Facts are a weapon. And you choose your facts and you choose your attack and your purpose is to suborn the identity of your adversary. And I think frankly, they're doing a much better job of it than we are. So again, how do we, how do we counter this? Is it, can we change back to working on facts instead of identities or is it a matter of being better at it? Um, we can't be better at it. Uh, some of our adversaries like the Russians are classic postmodernists. They're totally amoral. They'll say the most racist things and then they'll come in and talk about how police are being shot in the streets in America. We can't compete with that because if we tried, uh, let's say that we tried to stir up some kind of religious turmoil in Russia in certain places and we got caught at that, then, of course, the American government apparatus that did that would be pilloried. So I think that we're at a significant disadvantage for profound cultural reasons. And I think what that means is we better figure out how to do asymmetric warfare in an environment where we're already outgunned. Anyone else have some thoughts on countering disinformation? 
John, you, you look like you're thinking. Yeah, well, that's a dangerous construct. Um, so I, I would tell you that, um, yeah, the, the identity piece, I agree completely with what Brad said, but we, we've been tracking identity for more than 30 years. Uh, the, way, how, the way people characterize who they are, you know, I'm a Boston guy, so obviously I'm a Red Sox fan. Um, but how people change their characterizations gives one an understanding of what's happening on the street. And the example that I've used in lectures previously is Nigeria. So after Nigeria became a country and you ask Nigerians who they were, they said they were Nigerian. And then they described the tribe they belonged to, and then they talked about their family. And we noticed sometime in the last decade that it shifted. They were no longer Nigerians. They talked about um, where they were from, the tribe they were in, the family, their, their own family. And then they talked about religion. And we knew that when that separation happened, we had a divide, almost a seismic shift occurring inside Nigeria from northern Nigeria to southern Nigeria, which is the Muslim North and the Christian South. And we knew that was going to be a problem. And that's the reason you get to identity. So I think Brad's exactly right about that. Um, the, the challenge in this space is when anybody is afraid, they shrink in on the things with which they feel most comfortable. And, and that's not a sign of the times. That's historic. You know, and, and we, we always use narratives and the, the you know, the motion picture industry talks about archetypes. And you, you, that's how people have historically learned. And if you can evolve the message you want to deliver into a narrative and attach that narrative to an archetype, you know, like the hero's journey or any of those, then that's automatically connect and people aren't going to realize that's going on. But when they shrink into their own space, the key to this is to get somebody who they trust before they need to trust them. Um, and and we, we tell people, you know, at least for the last half a decade, it's, it's vital to work the relationships before the relationships need to be worked. And so if you have a trusted voice in a community that's shrinking, then one has an ability to do that. And the, the example I'll, I'll close, which is also from Africa, is uh, sometime in the last 500 years, uh, we were dispatched uh, to Zambia to work in activity. And the conversation we had with uh, Embassy Lusaka was, listen, uh, nobody's got any money. Nobody knows how to read, so forget the newspapers. They don't have any money, so they can't watch television. They only listen to radio. Uh, so, you know, we dispersed the team, and they spent time watching how people lived their lives. And, and we discovered two important data points. One, one was, which is true in a number of African countries, there was a form of rural royalty. There are chiefs and chief tenesses. Because the question we asked is when the goat eats the maize or the corn, who decides what happens to the goat? Um, and the answer was the chief tenes decides that. So we knew that if we could talk to the chief tenes and get the chief tenes as a trusted voice in the community, whatever message was being delivered would be validated by somebody who was trusted. And, and therein lies the challenge, particularly to Brad's point, if people are shrinking in because they're afraid of whatever they're afraid of, um, it's harder and harder to find that trusted voice. Over. Okay, I, that was uh, really useful. And I want to just pick up on two points of that. One, what you mentioned about identity, I think it's just important to, to note that it, it doesn't necessarily go only in that one fragmenting direction, because after all, Nigerian was a, a totally new identity, what, 50 years ago? And, and an exciting new one. So it's mutable in both directions. And the question, as you say, is, you know, how, how do you get people thinking in, in terms of those different archetypes, in terms of the narratives that are propitious for whatever we're going for, whether it's world peace or democracy or so on. But that, that question of trust is, is so important. And I think that's also one of the places where maybe we see some of the, the efforts to counter false narratives falling down because people tend to fall back on just saying, well, it's a fact, but in this world, we need, to, we need trust to, to hear that. So 
Yeah, David, you look like you have something. Yeah, I just wanted to say that speaking from the perspective of a novelist, a storyteller, I am being a storyteller on kind of a uh, at least uh, uh, an English language scale in the fact that my books can go everywhere. And one of the things that I realized early on is that every writer, the instant he or she begins writing, steps up onto a soapbox, whether they intend to or not, because their worldview, their concepts imbue how they build characters, how they build worlds, how they build, lit build literary universes. If I take a concept that you would not agree with presented to you in a political argument and I make it part of a character you like in a book, I give you John's trusted spokesperson in the form of this fictitious character, then that idea becomes more accessible to you than it was when it was being presented in a direct polemical discussion. And I think that's a part of of the whole process. That this it's not just a case of our our uh, drawing inward to those that we trust. It's a case of what gets injected into the information flow with the individual that we trust. If John can speak to the chieftainess and get what he needs communicated into the information flow in that rural loyalty network, then he has succeeded to that extent. I don't know that it is possible to expand from that into some sort of uh, large scale universal application, but can we find a large scale universal application or do we have to settle, rely upon a series of small scale fixes to immunize ourselves as best we can to the whole false information flow. And I think there we're going to also have some digging to do potentially on what is false information, because once we start talking about narratives as a backdoor to trust, we are talking about a whole range from outright propaganda to Disney movies to, um, you know, both of our novels, which are obviously much, much more principled than that. But have, but often play some of that same function of, you know, creating, and I think there's, there's another word maybe that we should be using in addition to trust when we talk about narratives, which is aspirations. So it's not just that we trust this character or the, the author, but that we want to be like that character. Once you can write a character that people want to be like, you can get all sorts of stuff into their head. Um, Absolutely. So, so some thoughts on that. And, but I, I also think maybe there's, there's a risk to that too, because if, that, that narrative is seen through, it can have a very different impact than if you have a trusted person. It's, it's a very different question of trying to see through them. Anyone else want to comment on, on either of those elements? Yeah, I, I, intellectually, I want to agree with him, but the danger is, uh, both from David and John uh, examples, is that you have a tribal leader in Nigeria our counterpart here are political leaders in the United States. Are they trusted? They're trusted by their tribe members, but they're not trusted nationally. Uh, the other group, and I'm not trying to single out any segment of the population, but uh, David, to your point, we identify with characters that are on TV shows or in movies, and somehow we subscribe to the fact that because we like that particular character, we think anything they say from Hollywood is absolutely brilliant and accurate when they're just repeating somebody's narrative that may or may not agree with ours. That's a part of the danger. It is part of the danger. I think that we have to be a little careful about who the we is in terms of accepting that uh, their, their, their value as a spokesman on a subject that they are not, in fact, in real life. I play a doctor on TV, therefore I am prepared to give you expert medical advice. Um, there's a subliminal element to that where, where it's you know, this is who I've seen him being, therefore I am prepared to be open to it. Um, and there's not, there's not a good fix to stop that. Um, and there won't be. So the best that we can try to do, th I think here, is come up with some filtration system that will encourage 
a certain segment of the population is going to think critically about what is said by anybody, including people they agree with. A smaller segment is going to, a larger segment is going to think critically about folks they don't agree with. But the problem is that those who think critically at all are going to be a minority subset of the population as a whole because, first of all, it's work. Secondly, it takes time. And third, it takes a certain degree of basic informed knowledge to be able to judge what may or may not be accurate. I don't know a good fix for that. Does anybody? Okay, we're, Brad's going to um, respond first, and then we'll go on. Yeah, I think I think one of the things to remember is that we're not working in the time cycles that we grew up in. Um, if you think about the way that we bury information these days, it's by Twitter. One of the things that has happened over the last three years is that politics has become Twitter. And what that means is that there's no time for anybody but wonks to begin to focus on deeper issues and nobody cares anymore about what wonks think. As you develop these tribes and you maintain the tribal boundaries through Twitter and through an overload of information, I think what you end up with is a society that is split as we are, not just along political uh, or, or uh, lifestyle lines, but along deep moral lines, because everybody who is not part of your narrative is defined as the other and as evil. So if you think about it, what the United States had 30 or 40 years ago, for better or worse, was uh, a uh, exceptionalist narrative, the shining city on the hill. What the US no longer has is an exceptionalist narrative. And I think that, that one of the things we do when we focus too much on things like trying to educate people is we lose the fact that unless we figure out how to structure narratives that hold this uh, civilization together, our adversaries are going to take us down. And in fact, that's what they're doing. And they're going to do it by ignoring things like books and heroes. They're going to do it through Twitter. And it's going to be at a speed, a cycle time, that the United States has not learned to master. And that, to me, is a very fundamental problem. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the OODA loop, which is essentially observe, um, orient, uh, act, et cetera, uh, that John Boyd came up with. What's happened is that our adversaries have gotten well and truly inside our OODA loop, and we're responding very, very poorly. They define our reality, and we have let them do this. I find it really interesting that you're putting a, a, a nation state level analysis on it, but let's go to John next. Yeah, so um, just a quick pick up on, on that point. Um, we've shifted away out of the UDU loop to find, fix, finish, and exploit. That's how we're doing it with information now. Because this notion of the UDU loop, uh, which was terrific uh, coming out of the industrial age and ahead of the information age, was by itself too slow. But, but the point I, I'd like to make is, is I'm recalling uh, reading a memo from um, Sullivan, who was the first president of CBS, uh, warning, uh, and this was uh, Mud and Cronkite era, as entertainment television was emerging, he was seriously concerned and warned the entire news department that the risk of entertainment coming out of the same device that news came out of ran the risk of trivializing the news. Uh, and it's a great memo because when one looks back across it now, you can see that we've shifted from information to infotainment at, at many levels. And, and then, which, which is really interesting because I, two days ago uh, on a recommendation from a friend, um, I went back and watched the movie Contagion, which is nine years ago with Matt Damon. Um, but in there, uh, when they were doing the news interviews, aside from the fact there are too many parallels to what's going on, Sanjay Gupta, a very young Sanjay Gupta, was in there as part of the motion picture. And I think, that, you know, and, and I have a lot of respect for him and a lot of time for him, but the notion that people who are presenting the news whether they're on Fox or on CBS or CNN, are then also 
part of the motion picture entertainment industry devalues their principal profession. And that is something that should never be permitted by any news outlet. Punto. I'd like to, to build on the, the last bit of commentary, which I think was very useful and, and very insightful. Rather than focusing on a political solution, why don't we try to focus on how to address the current crisis that we have in the medical industry, not the medical industry, but the medical environment, COVID-19. I think physical survival, medical survival, and economic survival are three objectives that we can all agree on, regardless of our party affiliation or tribal membership. Why don't we tackle that, try to resolve that information warfare game, uh, and I use the word game loosely, uh, but that's something we can focus on. That's something that I think we can solve, address, and claim success legitimately. Can we? Brad, John, David? So, so I saw a lot of heads nodding, so there should no, be. No, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to agree with you. Um, the, the notion of working the problem rather than working the divide has always been successful, e even when you have divergent opinions. I, I think back to, God, it's 30 years ago, we did Operation Just Cause, which was Panama. The coalition, think about this now, and, and we're going to wander a little bit into politics, and so my apologies to that. Um, the coalition in the United States Senate that supported the efforts against Noriega were the two senators from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Kennedy and Kerry on the left, and Helms and D'Amato on the right. It was at that time in our nation's history politically impossible to get to the outside of those four guys. And the teams that worked together on those issues, even though they were political enemies, because it was in the national interest, we have all remained friends over time and can address an issue without putting a partisan shield in it because we fought together once. I think also Bill Buckley in uh, a eulogy from one of his, his friends uh, concluded that he thanked him for uh, a lifetime of friendship, love, and fiercely honest intellectual debate. And I think that is one of the things that we are, are losing. Um, um, I remember Trey Gowdy's uh, uh, eulogy for Elijah Cummings. Um, political differences. We, we need to get back to the notion that it's possible to be wrong, not evil. Um, and I think that is one of, the, one of the casualties of the information age. Um, and the partisan divide that Brad was talking about earlier. And I'm not sure how we do that. Um, I tried to do it in my, my personal interactions uh, and in my social uh, uh, media interactions. But it's a national consensus that I think we need to, it's, well, it's actually, it's a world consensus. It's an international consensus. Now, it is possible to be evil as well as wrong. Okay, I'm not saying that it's not, but we need to be able to remove that from, it has to be that way. It seems so, like it's coming back a little bit to the trust question. Um, sorry, go ahead. So I was, I was just going to uh, agree with that, but with the, with the observation that when you're sufficiently tribal and when you have sufficiently defined everybody who doesn't share your narrative as being the other, then you begin to find it very easy to slip into moral rather than political terms. And I don't see how we get back, particularly because what we, what we can't forget is that uh, our two primary state adversaries, Russia and China, have both adopted doctrines and strategies that contemplate civilizational conflict. It's all fair game across the entire society. And as we talk about this in terms of trying to heal ourselves, I think we forget that both of those entities who are very powerful and very sophisticated have a lot of interest in trying to make sure that the United States remains in a state of internal civil war. So this isn't just a how do we help other people talk better to each other. This is a, you're trying to build this boat in the middle of a storm with no blueprint and you're sinking. 
And I think that, that we don't understand the existential threat that, uh, that the current situation poses to us uh, to the extent that we should. I agree. I think that, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. No, I didn't have anything. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I agree. I think that uh, one of the uh, at least temporary upsides of the pandemic situation is that it is bringing that issue into sharper focus, Brad, uh, for people in general as we look at how this whole information flow on the virus was handled and how it is being manipulated in the, in the, uh, the interchanges between us and China, for example, right now. I think there's a greater awareness of what you're talking about, whether it will, you know, carry over into uh, uh, reactions down the road. I don't know. I, th I think it was Einstein who said you need to spend 99% defining the problem and 1% solving it. We have spent 99% defining the problem. Can we focus on how to solve it? Yes, please. I have a, I have a question on the on the solving the problem and on the trust issue. Um, one thing that I've noticed in reading about people who have been de-radicalized or who have moved away from fake news environments is that there tends to be a, a component of an individual being involved, which is to say that people don't get de-radicalized by watching a different news show. They get de-radicalized by talking to someone some individual and I, I think it comes back to that question of trust how you get the trust of of someone is, a, is another question but to me i think that that you know the the idea of um deprogramming people through propaganda through um, mass information campaigns is is perhaps problematic and not effective any thoughts on that from the experts here um i think I think the whole question of trust in the kind of society that we've structured now is very problematic. And I would, I would kind of make another proposal. You can't do deprogramming of an entire society at scale. I think that one of the things that's kind of an interesting thought experiment is if you were going to build a new exceptionalist narrative for the United States, that included these very, uh, very vicious tribes, what would you do? How would you build it? What would that narrative look like? And, and there's some indication you can do that because to some extent, that's what Mr. Putin has done in Russia. I mean, he's gone back to the mother Russia, Eurasian uh, power uh, kind of narratives. And, and in fact, part of why he wants to hurt the United States, particularly in terms of its soft power, is precisely because he can then use that in his internal narrative. So I think you can do that, but I think it requires a sophistication about society-wide narratives that is very difficult to achieve. And it also has sort of the, uh, the foundation problem, right? Osimov's foundation problem. If you tell people you're building a narrative for them, they're gonna reject it particularly in the United States. So how do you build a new narrative for the United States without Americans knowing about it? Do that and the world is simple. Is, is the goal though a new exceptionalist narrative for the United States? Is that the same as, as combating disinformation? Well, I'm not sure that that's what Brad is saying. What he's saying is that we are at a, an institutional disadvantage right now because one side has done that and the other side hasn't. Um, the problem, what, what I think, Brad, what you're talking about really is a restoration of consensus in a society which, in which the consensus has been shattered. Is that fair? Well, I'm not sure we can restore anything, David. I, I think that's part of the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose, suppose this isn't, um, oh, oh, I don't know. Suppose this isn't the arguments in the civil right era, which were plenty uh, aggressive and conflictual. Suppose this is 1788 
Mm -hmm. Now, you go to 1789, 1810, 1815, you still have France, but it's a really, really different France. Suppose we're at that tipping point. How do we understand how we can try to manage that to, uh, to recreate what's best about the United States? But it has to be recreated in light of new conditions. Who makes the decision about what we're going to to recreate? I'm not saying I'm not saying that you your model is wrong, okay? Uh, because I think I'm a historian by training, and a lot of what you're saying resonates with what I've always believed and thought. I think that the problem is to go back to the trust issue for a moment. We have we don't have a a a group that is in a position to command sufficient trust across Richard's bipart uh, John's uh, bipartisan spectrum to pull exactly. that off. Exactly. Exactly. And so and so that's our challenge, right? Our challenge is how do you create a narrative that can fit a society such as we have now uh, where trust is weak where uh, institutions are failing. And, and you can do it. Unfortunately, the model is China, right? I mean, we all talk about the social credit system in China as if it were a method for imposing authoritarianism. But if you do social credit right, it becomes a trust mechanism because China doesn't have a society of laws. They need to have some other source of trust. And if your social credit number can become a source of trust, then I don't need to know you and I can create a society where you have a pseudo trust that extends across the society. How would you do that in the United States, assuming that we continue to fragment, which may well, not be true? It, right? would have, it, would have to be, it would have to be just cause over again. There would have to be, um, uh, the problem would have to be identified in terms that make it existential enough that yeah. we have to bury our, our tribal differences in the name of group survival. Uh, we may be approaching that point, I don't know, but um, it will be interesting to see how it works out. I think that's probably the most practical solution to the problem that you're describing, which doesn't mean it's very practical, just the most practical <laughs> available. <laughs> Agreed. Yes. I mean, as someone has noted in the, in the comments, there is this a credit rating system in the US, which isn't exactly a social credit system, but kind of functions in a similar way. You know, we do have this, we have a whole set of, of different attributes that determine whether people are trusted with mortgages, for example, with um, not credit cards, because we want everyone to use credit cards as much as possible, <laughs> but um, uh, with admission into, into different um, areas of, of social life. Uh, so, I mean, there, there is some of that going on and we can see through credit ratings that it's dangerous because a lot of it now is being done by algorithm. It's, it's pretty problematic. Um, what, but what about that, you know, the one-on-one -on -one, uh, trust? What about um, people going into different communities and talking? What about when you meet someone on Twitter that's different from you? It doesn't scale. I think that's the biggest problem. It doesn't scale. I, I think that's probably I, one of the things that I've observed is I can put something up on my on my Facebook account that I think is uh, just, you know, a humorous piece of satire. And it turns into a battle to the death between people who are commenting on it. And one of my friends tell, speaking to me about it, he said, I think part of the problem is that your books ap appeal to a very wide spectrum of political beliefs and philosophies. And so you're, when you put something up, you're drawing in people from these different, different philosophies. And I think that's part of the problem. If you were able to come up with a group that everybody was somebody, uh, uh, that everybody was willing to listen to to build this consensus at the top. What happens when the, their, 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 their tribal members who hate each other start trying to actually listen to them? Um, where, does that, where does that take us? Um, and I think that the solution is that if there is a solution, and I'm not saying that there is, is that it has to take us 
through that to the point at which you you can the bloodletting becomes less important than solving the problem working the problem i think john john called it um and i think that it's something that we may just have to reach a point where it is so bad that people feel no choice but to fix it do you, do you see what i'm saying where desperation becomes the driver and forces us to scale rather than work on an individual basis. But why, what is the incentive of any one of these powerful tribes, any one of these identity tribes, what is their incentive to participate, right? I mean, the short-term gain in power, in controlling your community, in being able to, to use your community against others and against policies you disagree with, what incentive do I have to join a broader effort to improve the situation? I mean, we're talking from the perspective of people who sort of, at least in the golden light of hindsight, uh, remember a more unified society where there was a lot of bitter uh, political battles, but they weren't the same flavor. And now we're not in that situation. But I how, have much, to... how much of that, that unified society is coming from a certain perspective? Because certainly 50 years ago, 100 years ago, there were people who were very much excluded from that unified society. So I think we have to be a little bit cautious about imagining that that kind of unity is, is the only thing that we're going for. Um, we have, uh, speaking from a U.S. perspective, there have always been just absolutely bitter ideological differences and fights. They've been carried on in different forums. They've been carried on politically. They've been carried on wherever you want to go. One of the things that we're looking at now is that social media has made all of this available to all participants. It has, but at the same time, it's also providing a voice to all participants. So uh, that, uh, that, that, I, that I think is a good thing. Yeah, I think that's exactly. one of the things that we're, one, one of the problems with uh, that there's too much information for us to process is that part of that information that's too much for us to process is stuff that was never available to us before that needs to be part of the narrative, part of the discussion. Well, so, and I think so that, let's think about just just to draw back a little bit and 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 open this up. Um, let's think a little bit about the structure of the information landscape that we're talking about here, because yes, there are tribes, but we're also all of this is mediated through Twitter in some cases, uh, Facebook in some cases, cable news in some cases. I think there's still people out there who read Time and Newsweek. Um, what? How does that structure? affect what's going on with disinformation? Are there ways that we could structure our media landscape that would change what we're looking at? Anyone? <laughs> Unfortunately, we lost John because he had, he had quite a bit to say on the yeah, thoughts. Yeah, I, I, wish, I wish we hadn't lost him. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact that there was such a, a, a deafening silence when you asked your question <laughs> is kind of a measure of the scope uh, of the of the dilemma. Um, there's a part of me that thinks that the only way out is through, that we just have to survive and figure out how to, how to handle this. I, my daughters are 18, they're starting college in August. They are both much more informed and much more ignorant than I was at their age, uh, partly because the information is right at their fingertips and partly because I had to go dig for it and they don't. Um, and I think that w whatever the mechanism is, we have to learn how to how to cope with this either through our internal processes or institutionally. Okay, we're, yeah. we're getting close to time. And so I'm gonna just ask for us to go through, um, for each, everybody to take a few minutes to just have some closing thoughts. 
Uh, Richard, I don't know if you want to start maybe. Just closing thoughts. You don't have to don't pick know. up on what we no, said. That's fine. I don't mind being the guinea pig and, and <laughs> being the target of opportunity here for everyone. Um, I'm not suggesting we go back in time. I don't, I think that number one, I don't think that's possible. And personally, I don't think that's desirable. But I do think we need to approach the political discussion, not as identity politics, not as victimhood, but let's try to work together to solve the common good. Now, I realize that sounds very nice to say, and it's very difficult uh, to do. There are so many entities that are so interested in being politically in charge, and I stay away from politics, that they're willing to sacrifice everything. And I think if we can identify and agree on one issue that we need to resolve, maybe that will help bring a little more unity. And that one issue that I've talked about before is the current medical crisis. We need to coalesce around that as a nation, as a world, to help resolve this so that we can all survive. Because if we don't survive this, then all of this identity politics and all of these political issues that we've talked about today are for naught. Doesn't make any difference. We need to survive. I grew up in the rural South with parents from Ohio and Chicago, respectively. Um, and I remember uh, the civil rights movement in, in the 60s and whatnot at a point when you would have, from an outside observer, you probably would have said, forget about it. This is a windmill you're not going to take down. And it was taken down. We were still not perfect by any means, but compared to where we were in, say, 1960, uh, this is a totally different country, a totally different society. So I don't think it's impossible to reach the, the commitment level that Richard is talking about. I think that it's going to take someone who is able to enunciate the reasons we need to do it on an almost Martin Luther King level to mobilize the degree of, of public support and enthusiasm that would allow us to accomplish that. And frankly, I don't really see anybody on the current political horizon who can do that because I think we all of our current political leaders are so captive to the tribalism that we're all decrying. So I don't know where that, that, that voice is going to come from. But absent that kind of voice, that kind of trust figure to get us all pointed towards the need to, 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 to reach the level that Richard's talking about, I don't think it's going to happen. And to follow up on what David said and, uh, and Richard said, I think, the, I think the difficulty is that we're, this conversation is to some extent focused on issues within the United States and how to fix them. And I think that that perspective is important, but I think it's also important to recognize that there are a number of both internal and external entities um, that are intent on trying to exacerbate uh, the problems we have now and are doing so very effectively. Uh, I think also that when we talk about things like, well, we got to regulate the big tech companies, that presupposes a model of the nation state that may itself be failing. The Westphalian order is, is becoming partial and contingent. Uh, if you think about free speech, which we haven't really talked about at all, that has shifted over to being a matter of the terms and conditions of the big uh, uh, social media companies. And I think that the shift of power, and it's not complete, I'm not trying to oversimplify, but the shift of power among the large companies, among different civilizations. Uh, we talk about taking down Facebook and Google, for example, in, in the US and DC. That's not gonna take down Alibaba. That's not gonna take down Tencent. So I think that, I think that we're in a very, Darwinian period where the weaknesses of the American governance model are going to become more and more apparent. And unless we can be more honest in addressing them, I think we're, uh, to use uh, David's term, we're historical roadkill.
I know you didn't use that, David, but <laughs> I liked it so much I couldn't help it. Oh, okay. That's okay. You know, I didn't use it today. <laughs> <laughs> so on that bright and shining optimistic <laughs> note, uh, we're going to move on to the next segment. Thank you all so much for your time. It's been a really interesting discussion and uh, good luck with your information consumption and production from here on. Thank you, Malka, for being a pretty good cat herder. Right. Thank I, you. Thank you for moderating this wild group. <laughs> thank you all. I do appreciate it. Um, we did lose John, with a, which I feel bad about because I felt his contributions were amazing. Yes. But uh, everybody, Brad, Rich, David, truly appreciate it.